I'm on the Google products security team, so basically I do code audits, vulnerability research for more or less all of uh, Google's products that we're about to release and we have released. Um, so what I'm looking at today is uh, some aspects of browser security, particularly as it relates to the GPU being integrated into the browser. And if you saw uh, James Forshaw's talk yesterday, I, I think it was really excellent to have his talk in, in, uh, in the schedule today because we have two very different perspectives, me uh, working for Google and working quite closely with the Chrome security team, and James coming from the perspective of the researcher. So basically, I'm a corporate apologist against the, the actual pattern. But nonetheless, uh, uh, I'll give you a bit of background as to how we got into the position that had the GPU and browser was about 15 years ago, we really started to get like real cheap commodity hardware. We started with the 3D effects booted. Uh, and uh, it really took off if you think about uh, Joel Carnac and this Jim Quake and things that really uh, helped push the platform. And it's reached the point now where all of your consumer commodity hardware is going to be back to the GPU. And as it turns out, basically all of them are Intel, Nvidia, and ATI. NVIDIA and ATI are primarily the uh, discrete cards, the standalone cards, whereas Intel is more doing the integrated graphics. But they do actually support the 3D graphics that are actually GPU and integrated chipsets now. And they're all effectively either running OpenGL or on Windows, OpenGL or 3D. So, with the um, with the position that almost all the tunes have the GPU, and almost all consumers have browsers that are using the web. The logical conclusion is to try to tie it together somehow. And it really started being pushed, uh, probably as far as I'm aware, back in 2006, where the HTML5 standard uh, came out with the Canvas. And the Canvas is a, it's a, it's a tag that supports 2D graphics by default. So an HTML5 only actually has a 2D graphics context on the Canvas. And Mozilla started experimenting with a very early point of making not just a 2D context on the canvas element, but a 3D context as well. And the, the proposition was that instead of doing uh, 2D uh, rendering or 3D software rendering, they were going to attempt to use the GPU hardware to render onto the canvas element in a div on a web page. And this eventually it was originally called Canvas to the other involved into the WebGL standard which is uh, something that has been implemented by both uh, Mozilla and the Chromium guys, and also Safari now supports it. I'm not sure about Opera. <coughs> but if you're using Opera, you probably have other problems. <laughs> <laughs> What's important to note, though, is not only uh, the Mozilla and Chrome guys that have been pushing this, um, as of a few weeks ago, don't be released Flash 11, and Flash uh, has their version of uh, having API into the GPU. Uh, it's probably on your computer right now as stage 3D, is what their API is for. And there's also Silverlight, uh, Microsoft Silverlight 5 is coming up. Um, the last I checked, they were aiming for release sometime this year, and they're going to have an API around direct 3D. So effectively, at this point, everyone is doing it. And everyone's doing it initially without much regards in terms of the, I guess, the aspect of security. So what are the high-level security concerns that without even looking at the implementations, we can start to postulate them out? The most obvious, I think, and this is the one that comes up again and again when I talk to people in the community, is the increased tax that all of a sudden, uh, your browser security stack relies on the third party security. And that finally, we don't really have uh, a great deal of understanding about the reliability properties of a lot of these drivers, particularly as it relates to uh, a web page running an arbitrary shader mode. So the term shader is going to pop up a lot in this talk. Uh, a shader is effectively a small snippet of C Life programming language that is manipulating uh, vertices of characters. Basically, it's a, 
a subset. I use C++ as a normal to print, but it's going to look a little bit more like C. <coughs> so already, uh, from, a, from, my, from my perspective as a security guy, I, I knew before I even looked at the implementations that this was going to be pretty serious. As, an, as a brand new attack surface, uh, it's potentially going to be very, very serious. I'll get into the exact reason why I think that is the case quite soon. And of course, whenever you are implementing something large and complicated, you also have some loaded concerns. And these are the sort of typical application security issues you find when writing browser code. Um, all of uh, Chromium is effectively written in C or C++, and therefore you get some quite low level issues around memory corruption, race conditions, and in particular, use after free, which is a really massive class of possibilities that's crept up on us quite, quite badly in the last few years. And this is just a hint of the type of uh, attack surface that uh, I was personally interested in. And in my age kind of position, when I didn't actually know too much, I thought, well, Redgel is going to have some aspects of the DOM. It's going to have um, some blue plugins of GL. Um, or D2D, perhaps in the case of Flash 11, and um, perhaps it's going to be some manipulation of shaders and so on and so forth. That, that sounds quite dangerous. And I was thinking, well, we're probably going to find some bugs again. And actually, this talk, for me, is uh, probably more concerned with the low level security aspect than the high level security aspect, but I'll be touching on the high level points as well. But the, uh, the goal of this talk, I guess, for me is to talk about a few things. One is to really describe the end-to-end -end attack surface so that you guys can really get, uh, I guess, a little feeling for where the vulnerabilities might be uh, in, this new, in this new standard. And I'm actually not actually, unfortunately, going to look at Silverlight at all, but I'm going to look quite close at WebGL, and I've just started looking at uh, Stage 3 Flash 11 as well. So I'm going to look at the attack surface of these two things, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about my approach to finding vulnerabilities in them and also run through some of the vulnerabilities I've discovered um, with, with some of the examples. And then, uh, particularly with regards to WebGL, since I know this is probably a little better, I'm going to talk about what we can do to build some hardening and perhaps do some mitigation work as well to actually try to build it and uh, to be more robust and resistant to attack. So starting with WebGL. Uh, so WebGL, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is effectively just a specialized context for HTML5 canvas elements. So instead of, uh, so that this is a canvas object, instead of asking for 2D context, we ask for a WebGL context. And at that point, we have effectively in JavaScript, in DOM, a, an object uh, that is corresponding to a WebGL context that we can then invoke operations on. Here's an example. So this is the 3D context, and I'm invoking a uniform matrix for VF. And uh, this is actually corresponds, uh, if, if you know it, to, all, to a GL call. And what it's doing is actually just taking a, an array of input, and, uh, in this case it's a 4x4 four four matrix of points, and it's saying we're going to make this available to a shader under the PR matrix, it's a uniform variable type. And you'd run that and then invoke the shader and then the shader would manipulate those points that you, that you provide and then uh, render it to the canvas object and then you get your photo or whatever you want. So uh, this is how it looks on And let me just break it up a bit. We have on this side of the blue, this is everything that belongs to the WebKit side of things or the renderer process. This is down here, native client, but we don't really talk about too much of this because uh, native client is still in development. And uh, this is the really uh, big chunk of the new code is in this new process, the GPU process. So historically, Chrome only had two processes. The browser process, which is unsandboxed. You might have heard about the Chrome sandbox. The browser process is unsandboxed. Responsible for all of the really low level uh, OS and API interactions and so forth. And then we have the regular process, which we have WebKit fits into. And a lot of the new attack surface is not in the regular process, but in the new process, a third process called the GPU process. 
But of, uh, of the components that are new to the regular process, it really all starts with this 3D canvas context. And the canvas context is basically responsible for taking in your JavaScript through V8 uh, with your bindings, um, uh, basically uh, splitting up all of your arguments into particular WebGL objects and passing them off through a channel to the GPU process. The GPU process and then, and then in turn will eventually pass it on to OpenGL. In fact, uh, we actually don't use OpenGL, uh, the, the full set of OpenGL for OpenGL. We use a subset of OpenGL called the Embedded Systems GPU. So already the intention of doing that is to slightly simplify it and reduce the number of operations that we support in general. Now, the concerns in the community are, are less around all this stuff and more around this. And so I guess part of the purpose of my talk is to give you um, some sort of insight into how likely it is to go from a 3D canvas context or a mapper module perhaps through the GPU process into the graphics driver and to be able to attack Open Geo API or the graphics driver. So, um, I'm going to sort of foreshadow a little bit here. I can't spend too much on the slide, but uh, it is quite important to note that the, the render process is sandboxed. The GPU process is also sandboxed. However, Open Geo API and the graphics driver, they live outside of the sandbox. So, the real concern is that if we have a vulnerability in this component uh, that it's accessible, by a uh, browser on a malicious website, then you could get code execution, remote code execution, outside of the sandbox directly without having to do any sandbox bypasses. So it's a very serious uh, attack surface. And therefore, we have to uh, treat it with the utmost severity and try to secure it as well as possible. So, just to go into a little bit of depth, I'll skip through this pretty quickly about the attack surface. Um, and going in from the, from the outside to the inside, we start with the WebKit surface, which is things like we have the canvas element in WebKit, it has some WebGL integration code already. So if you look into Chromium, you look into WebKit. Um, WebKit is actually in the third party path of the Chrome source tree, but it already has some very specific WebGL integration code there. Multi platform glue, because WebGL is supported by multiple browsers. You need some kind of uh, glue stuff to say that Chrome might have a different uh, actual context, 3D context object to Firefox. And, and WebKit um, obviously is not used on Firefox. But there are components uh, such as Angle, which is shared between Chrome and Firefox. Safari, if we look at an example, where Safari is used in the same WebKit and WebGL code as Chrome. There's WebGL objects themselves. So, um, now, apart from just having a context object in JavaScript, you also have some other objects in JavaScript representing things like uh, frame, uh, the frame buffer, or other, uh, other buffers, and uh, program textures and things like this. The program is just a capture and shape. Them. And VA is like JavaScript engine also has some specific VGA buttons. And you, as an attacker, can effectively target one of these um, components. And one layer down, um, so one layer of abstraction down, you have Chrome code, which is, um, I guess, a lot of uh, the, uh, the initial attack surface of WebKit is quite a thin layer. Some really bulky stuff is in the Canvas content implementation. So this is, um, if you remember earlier, I had the um, geo object that was um, returned from the get context method for Canvas. That geo object. Um, it's actually quite complicated, it's a lot of contact there. And the GPU channel, so in order, as I mentioned, there's a render process and a browser process, in order to communicate between them, we need an IPC channel. And the GPU channel code is in charge of maintaining that IPC mechanism. Now, the command buffer is a, uh, an implementation detail specific to Chrome. I'm not entirely sure if Firefox is Command buffer. And effectively, the way it works is the canvas context is in charge of uh, <coughs> putting into a ring buffer, which is a bit structure, all of the GL implications that it wants the GPU process to then uh, invoke on the driver. <coughs> and so the context asynchronously puts all the stuff into the ring buffer, or the buffer, 
and then the GPU process will basically consume the buffer and pass on those particular requests to the driver. Modulo some kind of action and so on. Now the GPU process, so once we've, we've uh, done some IPC, um, uh, IPC or through the uh, shared memory area on which the command buffer is actually stored on, we reach the GPU process. And again, within the GPU process, there's actually quite a lot of uh, quite complicated parsing of untrusted user input. And when you're auditing for the software security vulnerabilities, you really have to think about everything in terms of what input is untrusted and, and which uh, parts of the data path are effectively trusted data so you don't really have any of this. At this point, a lot of us are still having a lot of trust. So the command buffer decoding of dispatch, as I said, it's a ring buffer. They take out an element from the ring buffer and dispatch it off to the open jail or jail <coughs> systems. Um, the jail has systems implementations or generated as well, so it makes it reliable, uh, reasonably easy to analyze this implementation because it's very well structured and well formed. And the to transfer it, which is a piece of software called Angle. And I'll touch on this a bit later again, but just to give you a brief overview of what the shader translator is doing. So a shader is an arbitrary piece of uh, C-like language. Um, and the concern is that the complexity of the drive process in the shader is very large. The opportunity for things to go quite badly wrong is quite high. So what we try to do while we're still in the sandbox is we try to process the shader and we actually use a process called transcoding. So we take an arbitrary input shader, we parse it, it, we analyze it, and then retranslate it back to uh, the same shader described with a subset of shader operations. And that means that we as testers can then really look at the drivers for that subset, that non-subset that we're actually passing on. And the other intention of this is to reduce tax loss. And also at this step angle, we can perform the validation of changes. Um, one thing that James mentioned yesterday is this the ability for a shadow to have an infinite loop. So Angle is in charge of uh, removing uh, any or disallowing any shaders that attempt to form infinite loops. And the amount of validation they're doing in Angle is um, slowly increasing. The, the validation is getting more reasonable and more robust as time goes on. And then eventually we reach the graphics driver, which is in practice these days the NVIDIA or AMD ATI drivers. And uh, they effectively um, both have their own implementations of the GL API. This resides, uh, this resides in user land, I believe. Uh, actually, uh, uh, from what I've, I haven't reversed too much of the drivers yet. Actually, I think the OpenGL library straddles both user and build space, and then the device can kind of which is actually doing, um, I guess, your, your actual hardware IO, and it's uh, all in the kernel space. So, the dream bug for someone trying to exploit this scenario is to find a bug in perhaps the device, uh, the device driver and have a situation where if I can get Adam to browse to my website, I can get execution in his kernel in ring zero. And that means I have immediately complete control of the system and I don't have to be concerned with any kind of sandbox bypass or local participation. And this is why people are scared about this entire system in general. And I guess the question becomes, how likely is this to occur? And at the moment, I'm not sure we're going to uh, And particularly, uh, this is something not really explored that much, but the, the GPU will have uh, some firmware running on that to actually. So the, the, the kernel driver is responsible for compiling the shader and linking the shader, and then the link code effectively gets passed off um, to the, the GPU itself. And there'll be some sort of runtime firmware that's uh, in charge of, um, in charge of, I guess, uh, doing the GPU list. And this is a complete unknown to me. I haven't really had a technical touch this area. Uh, in theory, however, certainly 
there is, I guess, a theoretical possibility that you could uh, own the GPU directly. But whether you want to do that or not, I'm not entirely sure. Because it's unclear uh, what the part out of the GPU hardware, uh, so the actual microchip on the GPU, back to the main OS would be. Well, so I'm about to move on to the bottom of the process. But is there any like real quick question if everyone's like, are you kind of getting it yet? Or uh, am I just like way off basis? Okay. Okay, a few months. So uh, my job uh, is to find vulnerabilities. And it turns out I spend a lot of my time thinking about the best way to find vulnerabilities. And this is what I decided to do in the end for the GM. And I started, uh, I started effectively with the intention to do two types of review. One was the source code audit, and the second was some kind of form reaction fuzzy work. And in order for me to be able to get a handle to be able to do fuzzy in this instance, I felt it was necessary to get a broader understanding of R code that's in Chrome and Gel. So my first step really was to spend a few days just familiarizing myself with the code base. And the, what you get out of this is, is uh, in general, the most important thing is understanding where the entry points are for your untrusted input into this new code base. So I'm trying to, trying to really narrow down a little bit to code that I actually want to spend time auditing. And secondly, uh, my, my first intention is to try a type of fuzzing that uh, I call in my mutation fuzzing, it's not my visibility. And formal name per se. The idea of this is to take those entry points I've found in the first step and insert my own mutation code into that entry point to uh, make the input now form in some way. At that point, I'll then use some demos or something to generate a lot of valid traffic that's now formed, hopefully causes some crashes that I can then go analyze and sort of work out if the vulnerabilities are not. And the fourth approach, which came a bit later, is uh, a grammar based generational fuzzing, which is where I was auto generating my own test cases and then uh, testing these at runtime, basically running my test cases <laughs> in Chrome and looking for crashes. And I'll go into a bit of detail about 2, 3, and 4 and look at the kind of vulnerabilities that find this interesting. The different techniques find the very different types of vulnerabilities. So uh, the idea of source code order is. Um, if you saw the last talk, I thought you'd really nail what you were saying that there's sort of two approaches where you either linearly go forth from the, the outer perspective, with the high level perspective, of saying go from an entry point and trace it down with a complete understanding of everything that's going on, or perhaps targeting specific known API for those who the specific parts of the code directly. And I did a little bit of both. Um, but my intention was always to really stick to high yield areas of source code. So the areas of the source code that I knew were likely to, to have problems either because they're um, known to be a little flaky, which in the case of um, which in the case of angle and change translation, I already heard a few things about this code, and so I thought this would be a good area. Or just because they're very much exposed dominant face uh, or as well command, command buffer because I was also interested in testing from the perception of the native client module, which I can't unfortunately I can't really into that client. And here's one of the first vulnerabilities I found. It's really unfortunate you can't really read that. But um, if you squint it enough, this is the patch. And the red stuff is also removed. So there's a, a, a character buffer of 80, yeah? And a string copy. Yeah. And they replace it obviously uh, with a string copy with a, a defined name, which is also static. And it turns out this is a really, really trivial bug to exploit from a shader, because this is an angle in, in the shader translation code uh, in the preprocessor. Preprocessor, sorry. And it was in the, uh, so the preprocessor pre is like your hash defines. Or your hash includes if you know the CLC plus. This one was in the hash extension. And it turns out all you had to do to trigger this was do a hash extension with a long string and you had a classic stack overflow. And it turns out there's actually a few more of these very similar types of vulnerabilities in the end four or five. And I guess 
the, the point of this is that I found these vulnerabilities within the first half hour of uh, really sitting down and dedicating myself to source code already. Because I already had the understanding of the, the general code base from last couple of days of just familiarizing with that. Um, I knew there was a bit of bugs there, and that is what they just fell out one after the other for uh, several days. Now, uh, as I mentioned before, in my mutation buzzing, the intention is just to, to target your entry points, put in a, a hook with some code that would do, in my case, it was just a bit flood and bit insertion uh, mutation, and uh, recompile Chrome with these hooks in place in, in certain sort of selected and targeted areas, and then find as many WebGL demos, um, for example, test samples and testing frameworks, conformance tests, and things like this, and uh, run them over it uh, to try and generate the, as much valid input data as possible, which my hooks would then now form. The intention of this is to try and uh, basically trigger inconsistent states within the application that may lead to memory corruption or use after free. Or uninitialized variables, which is what this mode is. So again, Really bad screen, but um, this is actually a bug from a native client module to the native client context in the render process. And it has a SRPC endpoint, so SRPC is how they're doing their communication between the NAPL process and the render process. And this particular call is to initialize the, the context, and they don't even have this code in place to remove it entirely eventually um, for various reasons. And the bug is actually uh, quite a nice one. It's actually an uninitialized variable bug, but because they, they have a scope up here that is checking to see if the context, this is a um, canvas context, an analog, they have a canvas with an apple, but this is the context. They say if the context hasn't been initialized, create a new object, which is uh, at this point the object is initialized, but the context state isn't. And then send it off here to initialize context. But you'll notice that uh, initialize context can fail. There's an empty error condition here. And they check that, well, okay, uh, if it fails, then return that this, this uh, initialization <coughs> initialize fails. However, notice that context 3D is a global for this, uh, for this component. So we can actually call the initialized SRPC again. And since context 3D is now a valid object, it won't be enough. And so we're going to jump down here and start to use the context 3D object, even though it hasn't really been given any valid parts in that context object. And at this point, we effectively, uh, I saw a crash and had to work out what this crash was. And it was actually more than enough to get remote code execution. And so it's a, nice, it's a nice thing to see because this would be a reasonably difficult kind of vulnerability to spot during source code auditing. You might do it with you, there's a good chance of this as well. So this is why it's nice to do source code auditing and buzzing. Okay, so generational fuzzing. Uh, this is actually just something I've been experimenting with. I wasn't sure if it was going to work at all, and so far I've had uh, a little bit of success. For instance, it's found, um, I didn't really find too much in Chrome, uh, a few non-exploitable conditions, but it's found quite a few exploitable conditions in Firefox. Um, myself and James both had a CVE in, uh, a few weeks ago or something, um, and my CVE in particular was found using this technique. Uh, and the idea here is to write a high-level grammar describing the WebGL DOM interface and the shader language. And once you have this grammar, it's effectively, if you study computer science, it's effectively a context-free grammar. Once, you've, uh, once you have written this grammar, you can then uh, randomly generate samples that are correctly well-formed under the grammar, but it basically is completely random and nonsense. And then you can run it and just wait and see what happens with the crashes. But how can we do this? And in my case, I didn't really have much experience with this, so 
my solution was to write it, write it from scratch. So I released this tool, Dharma, which is um, similar to, if, you, if you've ever heard of ABNF, it's an ABNF inspired format that um, it's basically a bit nicer to use from the fuzzy perspective. It supports like persistent variables and things like this. It's a nice part of the meta functions. Um, and I, I wrote a read gel and shade language grammar uh, for Dharma, and then it's just generating millions of these text cases. And here's one of the Firefox bugs I found. Um, so there is, a, again, an object-like state of invite link, which is used in various places. For example, this meme copy down here, this one, has a byte link, and this byte link is compared against invite link, the global variable of byte link, for a bounce to get. It turns out there's a situation here with an allocation, and if that allocation fails, then the end data, the, the target of our copy, is here, is not going to be initialized, it's going to be null, but the end byte length is still going to be huge. And it turns out that in this end copy, we also can supply an arbitrary offset. So we have null plus an arbitrary offset that we control, and some small length that is less than this invite link. So basically at this point we can get being copy into anywhere in the address space with arbitrary power that we control. Um, and they fixed it, it was really simple. If M data was now after the allocation, they just correctly sent the invite link to zero. Because that means then that you wouldn't be able to get any link of data copy. This is a really common type of uh, buzz bug, I think. It's not strictly a, a use up free, but it's you just get these conditions all the time. Okay. So I think uh, what you have to realize is my job as an auditor is important. However, you're never ever going to make progress free of vulnerabilities. It is, I think, with a, a, with an attack surface, a sense of this, that's really important to invest uh, time and uh, money into hardening the attack surface to make it more resilient against uh, exploitation. Particularly given that a large uh, chunk of the attack surface, the drivers, is not under Chrome's control or Firefox's control. So to try and make uh, the attack surface on the drivers smaller and to try and make, uh, I guess, the validation of all the untrusted users more aggressive to use transcoding and things like this. They're all really important engineering um, engineering tasks that we can invest in to try and make it a little bit harder. <coughs> so what have we been doing? Uh, a few different things. First and foremost was to sandbox the GPU process and try and put as much of the validation and processing into the, into the GPU process. And this is the intention of this is to say, better to have a bug in our code than to have a bug in the driver. For a few different reasons. One, we can really aggressively sandbox the GPU process because effectively all that's doing this talk is one API. Modular and a couple of other things, but nothing. We can aggressively sandbox it even more so than the render process. Uh, what else? So secondly, it, is, uh, it turns out that there are some, uh, some drivers for different platforms for example, Mac OS X and Linux particularly, that the, the robustness of the, the drivers being supplied by the vendors is very bad, it's very poor. And in these instances, where the currently just decided to not allow them to be used in the GL at all, basically it's putting them up to hard task it. And it's really shifting the responsibility of the vendors to say, if you want to play this game and uh, have your, your customers to be involved with the standard, uh, then you're going to have to really invest some time and effort to making your drivers more robust and improving the patch cycles and so forth. And indeed, the opposite of blacklisting is the potential to do some whitelisting. For example, the NVIDIA driver on Windows, perhaps the biggest one, the most important one. Um, we can potentially at some stage look at whitelisting the only the most recent version of the driver, the most recent two or three. And this is, um, unfortunately, the reason we have this is 
more or less because the, the JFX vendor is still have quite mature patch cycles. And in some cases, non existent patch cycles, to be fair. Uh, secondly, oh, sorry, three. Okay. So we can also attempt to standard to check all of the GL invocations that we're making. So in the GPU process, we don't just have to take a web GL DOM uh, request for like binding a buffer or something, pass it directly to OpenGL. We can actually do some sanity checking in between since we're acting as a middleman. And we've increasingly started to do this. And again, the intention here is to try and reduce the attack surface, the fringe cases, that even though there's a vulnerability in the driver, you can't actually get it through our pipeline. And also the shader transfer from the shader validation, which I've touched on already, which is what the angle was is doing. Uh, the intention here, again, is to reduce the arbitrary set of shaders to a subset that we can hopefully more, um, more strenuous and test. And also doing validation on the arbitrary shaders. These are all uh, all intended to try and um, mitigate and minimise the attacks. What else do we do? So there's um, been some legitimate concerns raised about potential denial of service attacks. Um, I didn't spend much of my, my research time looking into denial of service because. I was initially concerned about the remote execution bugs that we're finding, so I was really trying to press on that initially. Um, and what we have, and, and there are some very valid concerns because um, effectively, if the GPU driver locks up, then currently we have no uh, good way to inform the user and the browser that the GPU has locked up and needs to be reset. However, we've started to work on this problem a little bit with the Geo Robustness extension, which is Basically, a consortium of um, ourselves, Apple, and uh, NVIDIA, primarily, I think, there's a guy from the world as well, uh, and then the other system side, to, um, to basically uh, invent a new mechanism to um, basically allow for GPU resets in these conditions of, um, I guess, uh, time absorption. And these two are kind of related. And I think this is kind of uh, the most interesting and important one because we, again, don't know how long this is going to work because we don't have a large uh, sample set of driver vulnerabilities yet, uh, which I'm sure will be required in the next two or three years. However, we, like, we are, um, basically, we're, we're, at Chrome, we've uh, put down a commitment to say if we know there is a, a, a vulnerability being exploited or if we can, in a situation where someone informs us of a vulnerability, in situations where we can, we uh, have a commitment to try and work around that particular condition with further validation or more stringent transcoding is the most common case. And the, the win in this is that although the patch cycle of the drivers is poor, the Chrome patch cycle is excellent, and so we can try and shift some of the burden to Chrome as opposed to the driver. And this is only a stopgap solution, effectively. It's a stopgap, so we'll do that until uh, the driver Cycle catches up. Wow. All right, so I'm going to uh, move on now to the flash. Uh, and this is for me a, a fairly new area of research. So it's a little bit just fleshed out and we get all stuff. But stage 3 here is Adobe's attempt to tie up flash and GPU to integrate together. And it is a very similar API to. Uh, to WebGL, we have the same notion of uh, context and program objects and so forth. And the, the idea is that this is an action script that you write, so people write a flash file and action script and it's the API. Whereas previously, all of the 3D uh, work did the flash and software. And as I mentioned at the very start, flash editing is probably now what we have to do. Interestingly, uh, we have WebGL only supports the embedded system GL or GLES. Uh, Flash 11 has decided to support direct relief, open GL, or embedded systems. And uh, again, this is, uh, I, I guess, for them, they are using direct relief by default on Windows, and open GL by default on Linux, and GLES by default on mobile, which now I understand is their best to discuss for a mobile flash. Um, 
Uh, obviously, I had a few bugs on the grammar first because bugs apply equally to writing content to grammar as to writing source code. That's very interesting. Uh, but once those were fixed, my my test case generation was well from the action script. And I could compile that with, uh, in this case, I was using NXMLC from Flex, which unfortunately is a major bottleneck in scaling this because it's written in Java, it's extremely slow. And so, yeah, so the bug I fixed uh, was use out for free. However, I think it's more interesting to show you. This is a, uh, an information because this is from my flash file. This certainly isn't. And if you saw James Warshaw's talk yesterday, he had a very similar bug in Firefox, where he effectively could leak information from the desktop into uh, the context of WebGL in this, in this case. And this looks, appears to be a similar, similar condition. And of course, there's plenty of things. This particular bug. Um, I find this, this one was an interesting task for it because I did a lot of my WebGL testing in a particular VM that was using the VMware GPU password, and I never encountered this bug check. As soon as I started doing Flash 11 stage 3D testing within like a few hundred test cases, I was getting, this is probably a scheduling bug, not a, a remote exploitable one, but nonetheless, um, this was triggering all the time. So intuitively to me, that seems like it's easier to access driver attack surface of batch and it's a WebGL. However, I, that's not the case yet. I'm still learning about this. But that was an interesting uh, point for me. So, to wrap up, there's a, a real big amount of uh, new code in there, and it's really good to juicy attack surface, and there's bugs in it. Um, lots of people are finding bugs in it, including myself. And um, slowly, I believe, the code is getting more robust. Uh, particularly with Chrome, we've seen, uh, I think, a statistically noticeable drop off in bugs being reported in the WebKit renderer components and the core GPU process. Angle School has had quite a few bugs, but we'll get there eventually with that one too, I think. And, so uh, to address the uh, high level concerns, um, so uh, as security people, you should intuitively be worried about Flash and WebGL and Silverlight and so forth, because the attack surface is big, it's a big unknown, and thus far it really doesn't seem like it's kicking off into the abyss. However, unfortunately, the momentum behind the, the, the standards and this intention to tighten and scrap the GPU does not appear to be going away. Not only do we have what well, I talked about before, Civil Act 5 and Flash and WebGL, there's also CSS, new CSS is doing it. It's a, a new standard that really transforms, and you don't get the same kind of granularity as you do with the others, but effectively they're just sort of tight wrappers around GL or Direct 3D. And another one that I'm sort of still thinking about, I'm not really sure what the implications are, is the aspect that the embedded system drivers for GL and so forth are kind of already attack surface. Because in, this, in, the, in the case of mobile applications, it seems to me, I don't know much about this area, it seems to me it's a prime target for routing, routing a phone, like if you are an iPhone or whatever, is to actually to target the, GS, uh, the GL API via an Amish's app. So I think for me the optimistic and progressive solution is not to put our heads in the sand and say, this is scary, this is disabled at all, but actually to try and work as early as we can as possible to build in the mitigations, the hardening, and also to do a lot of monitoring research to try and make them go more Any questions? I don't think we'll do this all we sit down. If you could follow me on Twitter, it would be awesome. I'm like in a competition with um, Power Up Flake because we get the most followers, and I'm so far behind. So <laughs> um, I remember recently the reading that the kind of Chrome, IE, all of the browser of each other was doing more uh, hard work and their efforts around the browser. I believe that more than just the 3D, they do 2D and other stuff. You look 
Yes, yes, so, um, the, yeah, I think this is referring to the, for example, Internet Explorer 9 does this really well, that their entire frame is now hardware accelerated. However, they don't, they, they, as far as I can look up, they're doing it in the composition, the page composition stage. So you, as an untrusted website, don't really control page composition to any particular degree. Uh, so I'm not entirely convinced that it should be that sensitive, but certainly Firefox own and I and I and so far seems to be in the lead on that one. Um, they they are doing page composition with GPU acceleration. Hey, I have a question right now. So can we use um, uh, people's browsers to crack some passwords for us? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Why not? Is anyone researching that? I don't know, but, but I mean, it's kind of funny because if you had like a really good cross-site scripting, like you run cross-site scripting with people's GPU servers and power. But the, the issue is with this is that traditionally when you're doing GPU password cracking, you're using CUDA. Yeah. And, uh, or or OpenCL. Yeah, or OpenCL, right. And um, so with, with shaders, you don't get that same kind of um, uh, power that you get from CUDA because for instance, shaders don't have any motion of points of reference. Yeah. 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 Uh, we've got any more questions? We've got time for a few. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So, with regards to the uh, infinite loops and shaders, mm -hmm. uh, and these loops from Windows, do you have any idea what changed? Um, actually, you should ask James because he referred to this in his talk yesterday. I think that they're blue screen XP, and apparently, as of Windows 7, it's not blue screen anymore. And I think James was referring to changing the scheduler. So between the API of OpenGL and the driver, there's actually the scheduler, which is deciding um, which of the people that are using the API is getting more access to the driver at any given time. So I believe the changes in the scheduler to make, make, um, make that properly predictable, or I'm not sure if that was, but it's still there. <coughs> Yeah, any kind of bit. Where are you? I can't see it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I'm just a little bit curious. The high level code level analysis that you performed, did they consider incorporating some of your uh, findings in their unit test cases? Uh, yeah, and actually, it's likely that particularly with Mozilla, um, so Chrome already has a, a quite a large fuzzing framework, and they, they're doing a pretty good job on this, regardless of my work, which is slightly separate from Chrome security. However, Mozilla, it's likely that we'll integrate the, the Dharma tool, the generation of this case fuzzing, into the ATS, into the fuzzing framework. Um, however, that hasn't happened yet, but there are discussions going on. Thank you. Oh, this gentleman over here. You're looking good, by the way, man. Yeah. You working on that? Oh, just a little. Okay. <laughs> Uh, does Dharma um, incorporate code coverage feedback to... No, no, you, you do the code coverage separately. And uh, what you can do, however, is if you consider a content to be grammar and doing random generation of content to be grammar, taking points from a set of all possible uh, outputs of that grammar, what you can do is tie code coverage back to test case generation to say that this gave me a really interesting code coverage. So let's select points close to that uh, generation that should have similar code coverage, but maybe slightly different. And this is an ongoing area of research. But for the code coverage, we're mostly using until then, which is the unit set from here to start. I remember reading a while ago that I need this way to support that gel at all because it really was a great idea. Yeah. So is that still the case then? Yes, that's still the case. The time is somewhere. And what do you think about that? They, they just need to say, if I can just. Uh, honestly, uh, um, I don't think it really matters in a way because you're still going to get the same feature set and the same attack surface by a silver light potentially. I think the majority of light is used these days, or well, just the majority of yeah, silver light is all. So, I mean, it's more of a product of the end decision, it's not really a technical decision as far as I'm aware. So, I also think the technical stuff and other people can worry about the policy and all that. This is JG, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, so um, with things like using this with like Firefox, for example, is this going to like, in the case of say, you want to explore a different bug, you want to load some insecure models, is that going to, when you're using this with GL, you know, is that like, say, loading insecure of your libraries up with Firefox when you start like loading these things? Or? Uh, 
Um, yeah, effectively in, in the Firefox. So the Firefox has a plugin container that you can see, which is set between the main Firefox process. And in that process, they will be loading NVIDIA's version of OpenGL. But that's all. I'll let you one more question. Thank you. 